Everyone joining me now, once again, we've had him on a number of times before, I always enjoy speaking with him, is author and journalist Max Blumenthal, who has written a number of books, the latest of which is The Management of Savagery, which we're about to discuss. He is also co-editor of The Grace, uh, the Gray Zone, I always call it The Greystone Project, The Gray Zone Project, which is... Uh, an enterprise I would say closely related to the theme of this book. And um, we will, no further ado, Max, thanks for coming back on the program. Good to be back. So this book has just come out, The Management of Savagery, and I got an advanced copy here uh, just so that I could take a look at it. And I inserted these, uh, these bookmarks in order to give the appearance of having thoroughly studied it before. Um, no, but I did, I absolutely did take a look at it. I hope you liked it. I did, absolutely, and I have my own way I would describe it, but maybe it's safer if I ask you to give the like basic scope of what the book's about. Take a shot. Well, I would say what it really does is, uh, is it takes a lot of facts, uh, some, many of which were already in the, in the uh, public arena, were already public knowledge, uh, some of which I didn't know, um, but it takes a lot of facts and it strings them together in a narrative that shows the relationship, the sort of intertwined DNA, the intertwined, the coevolution of um, the radical right, the anti-Islamic right in this country, the national security establishment, and radical Islam. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's a very good way of explaining my historical synthesis, just to show that there's been this hidden hand in generating a war on terror, and that's the national security state, the FBI, the MI6, the uh, CIA, um, in conducting actions outside the view often of uh, Americans who are supposed to be participants in democratic life, uh, semi-covert proxy wars like the one in Afghanistan, um, you know, arms shipments uh, to extremist insurgents in Bosnia, uh, extremist insurgents in Syria, Al-Qaeda affiliates in Libya, uh, that have had devastating consequences, destabilized entire regions, caused refugee crises, and then, in turn, destabilized the West, putting the ultra-right on steroids and helping fuel the kind of Islamophobia that Donald Trump exploited so effectively in the 2016 campaign. And, you know, we're talking now about, we're having this autopsy of Russiagate, how you know, establishment liberals and the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign blamed Russia for Donald Trump's election. Um, and we need to talk about why he really got elected. I think, you know, the financial crash is a big reason why Donald Trump uh, was able to exploit the hopes and fears of Rust Belt Americans, uh, as well as just neoliberal austerity in general. But then you also have Islamophobia, anti-Muslim politics for the first time became the central part of a major presidential campaign. And it wasn't just Donald Trump, it was Ted Cruz and even Jeb Bush who proposed a kind of Muslim ban that preferred Christians. We have to understand, we have to put Islamophobia in political context. And so I see it in the context of the war on terror. And I see the war on terror, not as a war on terror, but actually as a, con a kind of contrivance of the national security state that benefits from having a national enemy and which actually waged a war of terror on civilians across the Middle East and, and, and you know, is not concerned with national security in this country. If they had been, they would not have used extremist uh, jihadists and Salafi elements as proxies in order to break down independent stable states from Libya to Syria to Iraq. You know, one of the reasons why, uh, and I was thinking about this uh, going through the book, and I was thinking about it when you were talking to, one of the reasons why I said that I saw a, a connection, very deep connection, it's probably obvious to you, between this book, the contents of this book, and the Gray Zone Project, is because I recall that ISIS talked about the Gray Zone, right? They yeah. said uh, that Muslims in the West uh, wanted to live in a gray zone. I'm, try I'm trying to remember, this is my recollection, that Muslims and the rest wanted to exist in a gray zone where they could make an accommodation between the, 
the Muslim faith and, and uh, Western government and society, and that they saw their mission in a way as eliminating that gray zone so that you had to pick a side, their assumption being that Muslims would side with them. And my sense is that's exactly what the national security establishment and the right has also done. It's tried to eliminate, you could call it the gray zone or you could call it the commons where people of different viewpoints and opinions gather and coexist in a peaceful society, that they're both trying to eliminate it for their various purposes and accelerating, amplifying the intensity of conflict. Right, I mean, this is you know, part of the blowback of allowing ISIS to fester. And in the book, <clears throat> first of all, I show how ISIS exploited the sectarianization of Iraq that followed the uh, U.S. invasion. And the U.S. encouraged the sectarianization through the Salvador option of James Steele, who was a, a CIA operative in El Salvador, was heavily involved in torture. And then he began using um, basically Shia proxies in the Anbar province uh, to crush the early inception of ISIS, which actually wound up fueling the rise of ISIS. Um, he was apparently a party to, to torture. Uh, bodies were piling up on the streets, and this, also, this helped fulfill um, the vision of Zarqawi, who was the first leader of the Islamic State, or first attempted to build an Islamic State, based on the concept of splitting uh, Sunni and Shia apart and causing this sectarian rift. Um, actually, something that Ayman al-Zawahiri who was a much more educated figure. He was bin Laden's eminence Greece. He was a doctor from a wealthy family in Egypt. And he said, no, we need to unite all of the Muslims of Iraq against the U.S. occupation. But Zarqawi's vision prevailed. ISIS was born. And then it spread into Syria uh, with U.S. help. U.S. help in the form of a multi-billion dollar arm and equip operation to create the so-called Free Syrian Army. This is a project of the CIA and Turkey and Qatar and the British MI6. And they basically were a weapons farm for Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And I write about how the FSA helped um, what was then known as Jabhat al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda in Syria, invade Raqqa, the city in northeastern Iraq that eventually became the capital of ISIS, the capital of the caliphate. And Jabhat al-Nusra was actually a Trojan horse for the Islamic State. Um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, two weeks at, or several weeks after capturing Raqqa, declared it as the caliphate and declared an Islamic state. And half of the FSA, according to local reporters, proceeded to join ISIS and stay. The rest went uh, upfield to fight the Syrian Arab army alongside or as part of what remained of Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda's official affiliate. So this was the CIA-backed group and all the weapons that flowed in, helping ISIS establish its caliphate. Once ISIS does that, let me just kind of get, sure, to, the, get sure. to the gray zone part. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because <clears throat> I want to provide as much context right. as possible. Okay. Once ISIS does that, it starts using its territory as a base for propaganda, putting out glossy magazines like Dabik, mm -hmm. uh, and beginning to uh, penetrate the West with its uh, sectarian ideas with its destructive ideas, including an idea that was featured in Dabik magazine, the extinction of the gray zone. Mm -hmm. And what they call for, you know, as you explained, the gray zone is kind of the area where, uh, you know, Western Anglo people who are sort of native residents of the West and Muslim immigrants can kind of coexist. It's where Muslim clerics uh, can preach a message of coexistence while staying true to the tenets of Islam. And this is what ISIS sought to break down because as with Zionists, who need to ingather all of the exiles in order to fill the, fulfill their vision of a Jewish state in Israel and the Levant, or JSIL, ISIS, or ISIL, needs to bring all of the Muslims into its territory to fulfill their vision, to encourage Hijra, which, you know, in Israel they call making Aliyah. And so in order to do that, they have to push Muslims out. Coexistence is a bad thing, as for Zionists. Uh, acceptance of Jews is a bad thing. Anti-Semitism fuels Zionism. Islamophobia fuels ISIS. And so through a series of devastating terror attacks in Western capitals, uh, the Charlie Hebdo attack, for example, ISIS sought to benefit from not just the fear that they caused among Westerners, but the lack of acceptance that Muslims, including Syrian refugees, would receive. So they benefit from the ultra-right. So this is, you know, if you go back to what happened in 
in Syria where John Kerry said on tape that we were watching ISIS and allowing them to advance to force the Assad government to negotiate with us, in other words, the U.S. was using ISIS as a negotiating weapon, where they helped arm ISIS, the national security state, the people here in the Beltway, liberal interventionists, neocons, people who say they're against Trump, they're the ones who allowed for that vision of the extinction of the gray zone to come to bear by giving ISIS its capital, allowing it to have that capital. And then it's the ultra-right and ISIS that played off each other with this symbiotic relationship in the West, which continues to this day. Well, and, and a number of thoughts occur uh, around that. Number one, and again, we're talking with Max Blumenthal about his new book, The Management of Savagery. Uh, one of the thoughts that occurs to me is it's astonishing if you think that their goal, I, let's say it was the mid-2010s probably when they were encouraging, tolerating the rise of ISIS initially to put pressure on the Syrian regime, if I understand, if my timing is more or less correct, the sort of ahistoricity of it, the fact that they were absolutely replicating what went wrong in the 1980s, putting pressure on the Soviets through Afghanistan in order to, which you also talk about in this book, uh, for Cold War purposes, and in so doing, giving rise to bin Laden and Al Qaeda, that they're doing exactly the same thing again. There are only two explanations. One is that they're just astonishingly stupid, and uh, the second is that, in fact, it's not necessarily a bad outcome for some of the players involved. And I'm talking about on our side of this divide. Uh, to have these tensions escalate and these terrifying prospects, whether it be Al-Qaeda or ISIS, out there. But I don't, and by the way, those two explanations, stupidity and uh, venality, are not necessarily exclusive. I understand that. But I don't see a third option. What am I missing here? You're missing nothing. I mean, it was Big New Brzezinski, who is an honored figure, sort of a iconic Mandarin of the national security state here in Washington, um, you know, whose daughter sits alongside Joe Scarborough every day on Morning Joe, um, who uh, was the one who, you know, on Carter's National Security Council convinced Jimmy Carter to go into Afghanistan with this proxy war, the largest proxy war, largest operation in CIA history, over a billion dollars, Operation Cyclone, which Reagan proceeded to, uh, with a national security directive, uh, pour m much more money into. Um, the Saudis created a, mat a matching fund. Uh, they would match every dollar the U.S. Uh, put into the Afghan Mujahideen. And the Saudis helped establish, through Pakistani intelligence, the Services Bureau overseen by um, Abdullah Azam and one young Osama bin Laden, who became basically the financier of the jihadi wing of what was then known as the Afghan resistance, the Mujahideen. So Brzezinski created he basically helped open the gates for international jihadism to and explode. Just, and just to interrupt you for a second, I, I don't want to go looking for it now in these many well, this uh, is dog what ears. I'm getting to. Okay, yeah, but there's a quote yeah, by he, Brzezinski. And I wanted that, to go looking for that quote because that's kind of what I'm building up to. Mm -hmm. But he was first asked by Nouvel Observateur, Observateur uh, the French magazine, in 1998 if he had any regrets about the creation of the Taliban um, you know, which is sort of the logical progression of events after the collapse of the Soviet-backed government in Kabul. And he said, hell no, you know, I don't have any regrets about, I'm paraphrasing him, I don't have any regrets. Uh, we helped defeat the Soviet Union. That's one of the greatest accomplishments uh, in human history. Who cares if we got the Taliban and some, uh, you know, Islamic extremists? He, he literally said, who cares? And he was asked again by an uh, Iranian uh, filmmaker named Samira Gochel, in 2006, the same question on camera, and he repeated himself and said, the Taliban is unimportant to me. What mattered was defeating the Soviet Union. Brzezinski's family comes from Galicia, uh, which is, you know, Western Ukraine, which is now a base of, you know, ultranationalism in Ukraine. Uh, his family were landowners. They hated the Soviet Union. He was obsessed with this goal. And he, in order to fulfill that kind of historical goal of defeating the Soviet Union, um, you know, which is something that we still consider a great thing in the U.S. and don't think, we don't think about the consequences of it. He was willing to see the rise of international jihadism and in many ways uh, 
there's this traditional relationship that predates Afghanistan with uh, Britain uh, working with Islamist elements to break down states that oppose them and advance their imperial goals. And the U.S. sort of adopted that and then continued um, to use extremist insurgents in Bosnia, uh, extremist insurgents in Chechnya, extremist insurgents in Libya, Syria, and to a certain extent in Iraq, but really Libya and Syria were the big ones. And again, the consequences have been absolutely devastating, as I show in my book, for our political culture here in the West. And this book is really about us and the crisis we face as a result of the cynicism of figures like Brzezinski. I think Zbigniew Brzezinski, as brilliant as he was as a cynical operator, is one of the greatest historical villains of our time. Well, where would he rate in your, uh, <clears throat> your gallery of villains compared to, say, a Madeleine Albright? who famously said, now people are disputing whether 500,000 children did or did not die as a result of the sanctions against Iraq that she approved of. But regardless of the accuracy of the figure, she didn't challenge it when asked about it and basically said, I don't recall the exact quote there either, but that's uh, just a, a price worth paying. Very yeah. similar psychology. It was worth to, it. It was worth it. That yeah. should be the title of her mm -hmm. new book. It was worth it instead of uh, the rise. Was it the rise of fascism or something? Right. It's something about fascism. Yeah. Uh, she she knows a lot about fascism because you know it's it, she, it's exuded from her office, uh, and she now works at uh, a firm in town that's funded by the arms industry. Madeleine Albright appears on the pages of my book as the Clinton administration is seeking to sell its policy on Iraq which is very similar to the Bush administration's policy, except that it focused around containment, which was the traditional U.S. strategy conceived by George Kennan towards the Soviet Union. So they're treating Iraq like the Soviet Union, but at the same time, what they were doing through the um, Iraqi Liberation Act, which I think was passed in 1998, was they gave $90 million to a de facto used car salesman named Ahmed Chalabi, and his Iraqi National Congress. He's associated with conning the Bush administration right. into getting into the war in Iraq, but it was the Clinton administration and Congress that passed this bill that get, put $90 million into his hands because they saw the Iraqi National, National Congress in the same light that they saw the Afghan Mujahideen as freedom fighters. And actually, I quote Jesse Helms on the Senate floor, who was then the Senate Foreign Relations Committee director, extremist neo-Confederate Republican from North Carolina, talking about uh, how we need to use Afghanistan and what we did there as a model for Iraq. And so once that policy was put into place, and Madeleine Albright appears on CNN at a town hall to defend it, and she says that Saddam Hussein has chemical weapons and WMD. On CNN, this is well before 9-11, it was pretty much inevitable that some president was going to take the policy to the next step from containment to rollback and just open up another phase of the destabilization of the Middle East. One of the things that I point to though in that town hall is that it was open to the public and CNN allowed calls from the public and the public mounted a very strong op uh, campaign of opposition to this war and Sandy Berger and Madeleine Albright being challenged on stage had no response. And I think you know we should go back to that era and remember that sometimes on corporate media, uh, the people were heard from there were anti-war voices occasionally allowed on MSNBC. That's not allowed anymore. And people like Madeleine Albright run the show. I mean, again, she's another historical villain who's a revered figure in Washington. And her book on fascism was taken seriously in this town. Uh, I think, you know, I talk about the clash of civilizations, which you're familiar with, you know, Samuel Huntington's concept of the, you know, Judeo-Christian enlightened West versus the barbarian Islamic hordes of the East. Uh, Madeleine Albright offered a similar concept in her new book on fascism, which is liberalism versus authoritarianism. And we hear everyone spouting that binary concept of the world from Hillary Clinton to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It's sort of this common th uh, view of the world that there's this, li there's this liberal democratic world and then there's an authoritarian world, which could be Nicolas Maduro's Venezuela, Bashar al-Assad's Syria. Wherever we decide, we want regime change. And what we do when we target that supposed authoritarian world is not spread liberalism. We actually open the gates for the most extremist elements of those societies to come to the fore and destabilize the situation, as Madeleine Albright wants to. It's by design. Well, a couple thoughts on that. Again, we're talking with Max Blumenthal about his new book, The Management of Savagery. 
a couple. One thing. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, people remember Madeleine Albright, or may remember her from 2016 for having said, vis-a-vis -vis the Hillary Clinton campaign, that women who do not support other women uh, deserve a special place in hell. Like Margaret Thatcher. I assume she was not referring to the mothers of Iraq uh, seeking milk for their children when she made that comment about helping other women. But. Uh, that said, you, you, you're right about this polarity that's expressed between the liberal democratic order and authoritarianism. It is also sometimes expressed as liberal democracy versus populism, yeah, yeah, yeah. where populism is used interchangeably with authoritarianism. In other words, a dictatorship of the public against the ruling uh, elite who know better. I mean, that's how I, so yes, while you do have frightening populist movements, AFD in Germany or Donald Trump or whatever, I would guess that they would react with some, and are reacting in fact with similar ferocity to the humane governance of a Jer Jeremy Corbyn and Great Britain, for example, yeah. you, you know, I, my personal feeling from observation is that they're manufacturing a uh, uh, charges of anti-Semitism against Corbyn, for example, in order to destroy him and the popular movement he represents, which is, in, which is very democratic in nature, but they don't like where he's going with it, so it's being po posed as, and perhaps it is a threat to the kind of insular, quote-unquote, liberal democratic world order they represent. But I don't know, what do you think, and how, if and at all, does that fit in with the thesis of this book? Yeah, and we constantly see Bernie Sanders likened to Trump by center-left neoliberals because they're both, quote-unquote, populists. In other words, they're beneficiaries of a still semi-democratic system in which the center-left has discredited itself through its foreign policy and its economic policy. And they have no real answer to that except to demonize their foes as quote unquote populists, which is code for authoritarian and demagogue, and then you go down the line to Hitler and Stalin. Uh, but they refuse to put the situation in context and reflect on why they're losing. Hillary Clinton, of course, you know, blamed Russia. So I talk about Brexit in the book. Uh, Brexit's a classic example of a, a center-left collapse uh, of the public taking a stand that was extremely unpopular with the metropolitan elite in London. The only place where Brexit succeeded was in London. Everywhere else, I mean, I'm sorry, where, um, where Remain succeeded right, right. was in London. Leave, I mean, you go outside London and people are for leave. They're sick of being part of the European Union. Uh, they are sick of Brussels dictating their economic policy. They've seen their standard of living decline, and they were also fooled by a demagogic campaign run largely by Nigel Farage of the UKIP party, um, which is very much in line with the you know, Alternative for Deutschland and the Freedom Party of Austria and these new far-right populist parties, which, unlike the far-right in the U.S., believe in an expanded pension system and actually giving people their retirement money and free health care. So their message is, you know, retirement, health care, etc., and we'll keep the different people out of your communities. So uh, UKIP put signs all over the UK uh, that showed just simply a photograph of Syrians uh, walking through uh, the Balkans, walking the Balkan Trail, Syrian refugees who had been pushed out of their country because of this cynical proxy war that the West waged to flood that country with weapons, uh, billions of dollars of weapons flowing into that country. So the refugee crisis that's the worst since World War II is the inevitable result. And in the UK, it only agreed under Cameron to accept 60,000 Syrian refugees. So it's not like they're marching in the UK, but you know, you're in Manchester, you're in Birmingham, wherever you're in a small town, and you see these signs and you say, I don't want that coming here. Partly because I've never dealt with those kind of people and I have prejudiced, chauvinistic attitudes, but also because I'm losing my pension and I don't know what's gonna happen. And a poll, a YouGov poll, showed that over 70% of Leave voters voted on the basis of immigration, on the refugee issue, that those signs worked. Now let's look at the center left in the UK and how they responded to this situation overall. I, pay, I point to one figure who is very similar to Hillary Clinton uh, in her understanding of the world, except that she may have been more humane to Palestinians, uh, may have been more sincere in her views. Her name was Joe Cox. She was murdered by a neo-Nazi who uh, 
screamed England first after he stabbed her to death, and it was the opening shot and of she Brexit. She was a member of Parliament. She was a member yeah. of Parliament, uh, big supporter of. Well, I wouldn't call her a Blairite, but she was a big opponent of Jeremy Corbyn from within the Labour Party. And she was planning on introducing a paper that she had signed off on to coincide with the release of the Chilcot Report, which is the devastating report that exposed the lies of Tony Blair on Iraq, that basically said, Syria is not Iraq. We should not give up our interventionist attitudes just because of this depressing result in Iraq. And that was going to be her paper, that was going to be her baby, and she was murdered. It was introduced later, instead by her husband, Brendan, who proceeded to attack Jeremy Corbyn over his opposition to bombing Syria and invading Syria. And, you know, so uh, the reason I point to Joe Cox is to show the kind of hypocrisy of the center left and why they're losing, because she was so dead set on destabilizing Syria further with this humanitarian interventionist sham. And at the same time, she was such a champion for refugees and welcoming them, them in. And it's that hypocrisy that the Brexit voters hate so much. I'm not justifying her death in any way. It's one of the most horrific things that's happened in recent UK history. Uh, that's not why I'm... But Hillary Clinton embodies the same hypocrisy. And these are the people who are responsible for the refugees having to leave their homes. The refugees don't want to leave their homes. They don't want to be in the UK largely. And it's these people who are largely responsible, but we only look at the far right and their demagogy to understand Brexit. And we need to look a little bit deeper and put it in context. Well, you know, that attitude towards the refugees, I mean, first of all, of course, it's better to be compassionate to them than not. But on the part of people who created the refugee problem to begin with, it brings to mind the old Simpsons episode about a hurricane where they open the church to the hurricane uh, to the people who survived the hurricane but are left homeless, and the church sign says, God welcomes his victims. You remember yeah. that? Yeah. There, there, there is a certain similarity there. And, and, and it also points to something extremely serious, which is, uh, which you'll find center left Democrats in particular vehemently arguing against, which to me is unquestionably true and has been true throughout history, which is that you would have a ruling consensus. All those things on which there has been bipartisan consensus in the U.S., in the U.K., in Europe for decades now uh, that has broken down, that has failed to serve working people. And there has been no credible alternative presented to those people by and large other than Corbyn or Bernie or, uh, you know, some uh, Podemos maybe in, in Spain. But uh, it, largely there's been no alternative that that is fertile ground for uh Right, far right populism for bigotry. That, that I think there's historical record that uh, racism and and xenophobia increase when people's lives are going to hell and they don't know why. They blame the other. They blame the outsider. They blame the stranger. And then of course there are demagogues ready to take advantage of their confusion uh, and exploit it, like Nigel Farage or Donald Trump or anybody else. But that doesn't excuse the fundamental failure of the centrist elite to meet a to meet people's economic needs and b to conduct a foreign policy that's humane and wise. Yeah. I mean, do you? Yeah, I assume you agree. But if yeah. you disagree, tell me. No, that's an that's an important point to make. Is we have to consider what our alternatives are um, to a hypocritical center left and a you know extreme. Some would even say fascistic uh, right wing. Uh, that's on the rise. And, you know, the, the, the politics of the European far right are really embraced and embodied by Trump, and he's shown how this is the future of the Republican Party. Uh, and I write about how, you know, that, that kind of transatlantic politics developed within the Republican Party at a grassroots level, going, you know, going to CPAC years back and seeing Gert Wilders being brought there, the, you know, Islamophobic far right figure who called for banning the Quran in um, the Netherlands. And you know, who just, has an ideological soul brother in this country, among others, Steve, in Sam Harris. Sam Harris, well, Steve the, King also. Steve King, but but I, I think the rise of new atheism. New atheism is a huge part of it. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, in seeding the culture, especially among younger men uh, who you know re listen to podcasts when they're at the gym or whatever, right, right. and who don't really have the intellectual background to counter. Uh, Sam Harris, who sounds, he just sounds so convincing. Jordan Peterson sounds so convincing right. if you don't really have the context, the experience, or the intellectual background. 
including you know experience with actual women or Muslims, or, you know that kind of thing. But you know b back to the point. I mean, I don't think Bernie Sanders presents a holistic uh, alternative um, to these forces. I think you know he's been infected with the foreign policy of the center left, the neoliberal foreign policy, and he he's not an anti-interventionist. He's more sort of an internationalist who prioritizes domestic politics and would prefer to stay away from it. I think Jeremy Corbyn has. Um, we're at a point now where he's been sufficiently neutered to the, po to the degree that if he comes into power, uh, I'm not sure what he'll be able to accomplish. But I write about one incident in my book where Jeremy Corbyn responded exactly the way a politician should to a devastating terror attack. And he was brutally, ruthlessly attacked by figures from the national security state and their house organs like, you know, the Daily Tele the UK Telegraph, also known as the Tory Graph. Here's what happened. Um, the Libya proxy, the Libya regime change war had a devastating effect on Europe, not just a refugee crisis, but a, a security problem. Uh, in Manchester, the MI6 had nurtured and fostered a group of Libyan exiles who would be sent back and forth um, to Libya to undermine Gaddafi. They'd even attempted to assassinate him. Uh, they were affiliated with the uh, Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which started out as an Al-Qaeda affiliate after its main leaders participated in the Afghan proxy war. Uh, Ram I think his name was Ramadan Abedi, was a key figure in the rat line from Manchester to uh, Benghazi. He participated in the regime change war in Libya. He was a member of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. He was given a passport by the MI6, which is the foreign wing of Britain's intelligence services, along with all of his buddies. And then his son came with him, Salman. And Salman took an even more extremist line than his father. He went to Syria for training, joined up with ISIS, participated uh, with ISIS in some uh, activities in Libya. And then he and his father were rescued on a boat by the Royal Navy, rescued. They were basically taken back with a one-way trip back to Manchester. A year later, in 2017, Salman Abedi carries out the worst terror attack in, in British history, I think, at a concert of Ariana Grande, killing young girls with a nail bomb. Disgusting attack. And Jeremy Corbyn, you know, the leader of the Labour Party, he looks at the facts. And he realizes this guy was one of our guys. This isn't about Islam. This isn't about Libyan immigrants. This is about what we have done and what unelected figures in an opaque national security state have done to our society with their cynicism and what one uh, young man who's been placed into war has come back to harvest. And he blamed, he pointed the finger at the national security state and he said, you know, foreign, uh, you know, our foreign policy experts have assured us that these wars were a good idea. We shouldn't listen to them anymore. He was brutally attacked and he went up in the approval ratings. He went up in the polls. The British public responded to this. This is the kind of message we, if we hear it from a Bernie Sanders, if he's pushed by someone like Tulsi Gabbard, I guarantee you he will be rewarded and he needs to be ready for an incident like this in the United States. And, and by doing so, he can push back against the Islamophobes. Uh, he can push back against Trump, who, you know, as I show in my book, used the Orlando Pulse Massacre, who uh, carried out by another young man with very close connections to the FBI. Uh, he used that to great effect to defeat and embarrass Hillary Clinton. It's an incident we've totally forgotten about in 2016. Yeah, well, there's so much more like that in this book. I wish we could talk about it more, and perhaps we will at some point. And by the way, your descriptions of people are sometimes graphic. I think you called Charlie Wilson, what, an alcoholic Bulgarian or something? And Bin Baz, the preacher, I think you you called him unsightly, which caused me to actually look up his picture so just, on the Internet. Yeah, just look up I mean, ben you were a little Baz. rough on him. You were a little rough on him, but yeah, he's unsightly for sure. You know, he, I think he passed a, um, a fatwa that women have to cover their hands. This is the, you know, Saudi state cleric. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, no, he's one of the worst. Sort yeah. of imposing a, you know, a vision that we have helped them, pro helped project across the Middle East. So it's important to kind of look at these people in a kind of vivid way and, you know, maybe some of my... I'm sorry if I offended followers of Bin Baz or uh, uh, supporters know. of Charlie Wilson. Yeah, know, yeah. But... well, I, I'm not sure a lot of them will be reading your book, but of course, <laughs> anybody's 
anybody is good for sales. So the book is The Management of Savagery by Max Blumenthal. I encourage folks to read it, especially because I've been seeing that some of your book signings and other things have been... Well, one. Uh, politics and Prose. Politics and Prose has postponed my talk under pressure from the Syrian American Council, a regime change lobbying group that was involved in pushing for the war on Syria, along with other elements online that want to burn my book without having ever read it. Well, it redoubled my uh, uh, desire to have you on the program, and uh, it, people should all the more, all the more reason to read it. So Max Blumenthal, uh, co-editor of the Gray Zone Project and author of The Management of Savagery, thanks for coming back on the program. Great discussion as always. Thanks a lot, RJ. <laughs>